What's up, emotionally attractive people? It's your man, Michael Eldridge here, reading off the rules for Kemet Seth. This is an expansion to one of my favorite board games, Kemet, and I am not explaining the rules, meaning I will not be telling you how to play. I will be reading the rules. So if you want someone to just teach you how to play, that is a different person who is not this person. This person, me, is just reading off the rules. So let's jump right into it. Kemet Seth. Also, I have with me here my sidekick. Her name is Sexbot9000, and she has agreed to help out by reading some of the foreign names so I don't mess them up. Go ahead, Sexbot9000. An expansion by Jacques Buried and Guillaume Montange, illustrated by Dimitri Bula and Emil Dennis. Well, thank you very much, Sexbot9000. I'm still sad that you told me yesterday you only want to be friends. Let's go right into it. The Valley of the Nile shudders. In the heart of the Delta, a dark purple light pierces the skies and chills your troops with fear. An all-powerful city emerges in the Delta of the Nile, dominated by the Amethyst Pyramid. An ancient god has awakened, and his cruelty is matched only by his fury. Seth is back. Only the alliance of Kemet deities will be able to defeat the wrath of the god of chaos. To protect the Black Lands from this new threat, you will coordinate your strategies, rebuild the sacred temples that have been buried in the desert for eons, perform the great ceremony, and invoke the help of the mighty Osiris. Now, I've read this fluff before in my unboxing video, but it is delightful and I love it. Let's learn how to play this game by reading these rules together. You can follow along on the screen if you want to visually read while I read, but otherwise you can just listen to my voice box say them into your ear holes. Goal of the game. In Comet Seth, players are separated into two teams. A player plays Seth and aims to take control of Comet's black lands. The other players embody the alliance and will have to resist this invasion. Now, I'm going to be doing commentary throughout this video a little bit probably because that is how I rock and roll. And it is noteworthy that the board does not look black at all. It looks yellow like desert, but that is okay. I get what they mean. On the right, there's a list of game components. And as you might expect, this includes all of the game components. So I'm not going to read those because that's not so interesting. And that's not the rules of the game. Just make sure you have all your stuff in the box that you're supposed to have. That's all I'll say. Elements of the game. The City of Seth. The game board is modified by placing the City of Seth on the Nile Delta. The City of Seth is only accessible through the portal of Seth located on the desert space bordering the wall of his city and the desert space bordering the west bank of the Nile. Seth may always use the portals whether they are closed or open. The Alliance can use the portals when the one on the west bank of the Nile is open. The portals of Seth. Seth's portals are connected to each other and are considered adjacent when using the move action. So we have these cool portals. We show that one side is closed, one side is opened here. Or um, rather, that's what they look like, closed or open. The sacred temples. The sacred temples are new figurines that the Alliance will build during the game. The figurines of the temples consist of three different levels to be assembled when they're built. And you can see them here. They're very cool. There's three of them, and each of the three has three parts, as in three levels, and they look awesome. If you're like me, you may have to re-listen to certain parts. YouTube has this new feature with, like, this rewindy thing where you can basically just choose the part that you want to listen to. Also, note, male pronouns have been used for simplicity and readability. I find that offensive because they're implying that us males are more simple and me not be simple me be smart and complex the day face track i make jokes sometimes too i'll try not to make too many you're here to read these rules i i'll stop let's keep going with the rules the day face track the day face track is placed above the city of seth according to the number of players so a little commentary naturally this is a balancing thing it kind of shows how many actions what order things go in because obviously if there's more players you want to make Seth a little bit more powerful against them. And if there's less players, you want to make Seth not quite as strong. Game setup. Seth. The player who plays Seth takes the following game items. One, his individual tray. 
and the number of purple action tokens equal to the number of players in the alliance plus one. His prayer marker is placed on the sixth space of his prayer point scale. It looked like little onks. Two, the purple pyramid placed at level one at the intersection of the three sectors of his city. Three, 15 units, 12 of which are placed in his city. Note, Seth's troop troops can hold up to six units. So when he's traveling around, you can have six dudes. And of course, each dude represents, you know, hundreds or maybe even several thousand fighters thematically. But six instead of five, that's huge. Four, next to the game board are laid out the power of Seth tiles and the deck of his divine intervention cards, which will have been previously shoveled. He has his own unique DI, divine intervention deck. That's cool. Five, the monster miniatures, Vulture, Crocodile, Cobra are placed on their respective power tiles. Six, the Battle Mirror Combat card is placed next to its power tile. So he also has a combat card that you can purchase and is not native to his collection. Seven, six combat cards specific to Seth. Two of them are used with the Tassetti expansion. Interesting. So, um... It sounds like even though you can't play with the Tassetti module with the Seth game, if you still play with other modules from that expansion, such as the Black Pyramid and the, you know, Berserk card, you would use these additional cards also. Step eight, seven creature cards specific to Seth. Three of them are used with the Tassetti expansion. Nine. He places the portal token on the desert space bordering the west bank of the Nile on its closed side. 10. Seth draws a DI card and then chooses a level 1 purple pyramid uh, power tile without paying the cost and places it in his reserve. So wrapping up uh, here, Seth sets up, you know, you make sure you have the battle cards according to if you have Tassetti or not and the one that's purchasable along with purchasable monsters go away you can't get them until you buy them and you just set up the rest according to how it is here starting with just one pyramid instead of the potential three or four game set up for the alliance the members of the alliance proceed with the same setup as in the base game with the following specificities one they replace the di card deck with the commit seth specific alliance di cards deck so, just as Seth has his own unique deck, the Alliance, the other players against Seth, use a replacement deck. 2. The Victory Points tiles, level 3, are replaced by those of Komet Seth in the corresponding colors. 3. Legion and Sphinx blue power tiles are replaced by those in this extension. 4. The Osiris board is placed next to the game board. Five, the Osiris miniature is placed on its corresponding power tile. Six, the temple power tokens and four prayer tokens are placed face down next to the game board. Seven, each member of the Alliance gives one of his action tokens to the player playing Seth. Weird. Eight, the transparent turn order token is placed on the first space of the day phase track. Nine, each player chooses, without paying the cost, a non-purple level one power tile, consistent with its initial configuration of pyramids, and places it in its reserve. Alliance members can consult each other on the choice of their starting pyramid and power. So when they said its initial configuration of pyramids... And the language is a little bit confusing and it's clearly translated, but I think they're saying that, you know, if you get a level one red power tile, you need to have the red pyramid in play. You couldn't start with just the blue and white and get the red level one power. I think that's what they're saying. If I ever make any mistakes with this, please correct me in the comments and I'll try to add a little caption or whatever to correct myself in turn. So without re-detailing it all again, this is just a visual display of the setup of the board. Here we see Seth's cool 
side over here with his power tiles, the purchasable card. We see the alliance people set up the way we normally would be, except they're starting with their additional power tile. Two of them went for the priestess, which just makes sense. Many of us feel the priestess is great for starting. We have the regular power tile set up as usual. Then we have these viable temples, the other token stacks, and basically the rest of the new stuff described. Very, very cool. And we see Seth City now overtaking the northern temple, whether it's the Delta Temple on one side of the board or the Sanctuary of All Gods on the other side. There's just a lot of power here. And thematically, it's important to note that Seth's fighters are not human. They are like crazy monster dudes who are just terrifying birdish type creatures. All right, game turn. A round consists of a night phase and a day phase with an eclipse, depending on the number of players. The eclipse part is new. It will be necessary to refer to the corresponding phase track. Night phase. This phase is identical to Comet for Alliance members. Seth performs his night phase before the Alliance. During the night phase, Seth gains a number of prayer equal to the number of players in the Alliance and draws a DI card from his deck. Now, I won't recap all the rules to the base game, but it's just note for comparison that every player normally gets two prayer points in the base game. During the night phase, so Seth gets prayer equal to the number of Alliance players, and uh, as well as the DI card. So he's still pretty similar. And the, the Alliance players do what they would do normally. So pretty similar also. Day phase. In Comet Seth, day phase is completely different. Seth and the Alliance play their turns alternately. Hmm, alternately. Seth starts and ends the day phase. Alliance turns. Each member of the Alliance performs an action in the order of their choice. Seth turns. Seth performs one or more actions, depending on the number, on his turn space. So here we see over on the right, it shows the day phase track. So this will be a different track depending on number of players. And basically, in this first one, we see purple and it's two. So Seth plays two actions. Uh, and the next one, alliance turn. So that means that each alliance member does one action. Uh, then there are eclipse moments. And that's what we're jumping into here. Eclipse. An eclipse happens during the day phase when Seth is playing against three, four, or five players. Seth completes his eclipse phase before the, uh, the alliance. During this phase, all night effect power tiles are triggered. Interesting. So the next part is changes in the rules, but uh, this is very interesting because normally night phase is when you get prayer for... The temples you've taken over, you get your automatic prayer that you, everyone gets worth two, and you also get a divine intervention card. Then you also trigger all your night powers. But this is saying that the eclipse is like kind of a partial night, which makes sense. It's an eclipse where you don't do that first badger stuff, but you do all the night power tiles or, or things that are triggered automatically because of powers. Very cool. Here we read on to changes in the rules. Move slash attack. Players can cross a space containing allied units during their move, and thus momentarily exceed their troop and creature limit per space. Hmm. Interesting. However, they must respect their troop and creature limit per space at the end of their move. Now in the base game, of course, this is quite a change because... Even in the midst of moving, you can't exceed your maximum. But here you can with your allies, as long as you end it correctly. Recall a troop. When players recall a troop, they recall a number. Uh, they re they recover a number of prayer equal to the number of units recalled, minus one. So clearly, this must be a balancing thing in the base game. Recalling simply gets you the number of units you recall. Up next, Seth-specific rules. During the night phase, 
Seth gains a number of prayer equal to the number of players in the Alliance and draws a Divine Intervention card or DI card from his deck. Seth has a troop limit of six units and one creature, you know, per troop, obviously. So the one creature max is the same as any, ally any regular commit troop. Next, Seth can only recall a troop if he loses a battle. Hmm, unlike other uh, uh, regular players who can recall if they win or lose. Next, Seth can only win combat victory points. Now that's it's confusing the connotation of that. I'm sure it'll be clarified. Does that mean is that mean to uh, infer that you can't be awarded combat victory points by some other way, or is that meant to infer that they're the only kind of combat? Uh, the only kind of victory points he can get are combat victory points. I think that's what they are meaning to say logically. So if that's true, that means Seth is all about warfare, not any other kind of building up. Victory conditions. Seth wins the game immediately if he gains his eighth battle victory point, or ten if the player playing Seth is more experienced than the Alliance players. Interesting. So in the base game, you can play to eight victory points is the when it ends, or ten. But in this version, they're saying how you can basically play it so that the other people need to do what's regular, or Seth needs ten, kind of like a hard mode for Seth slash easy mode for alliance players. Victory conditions also. He can win if the alliance no longer has any units in play. This is huge because this is basically the first time that it's possible to have an instant win, uh, instant win in this game, regardless of victory points. If he wipes out everyone, there's no military left. Seth wins. Very awesome. On the right, we have a reminder. Reminder, in a four-player game, Seth plays against three members of the Alliance. He has four purple action tokens and three Alliance action tokens, one in each color chosen by the Alliance players. Well, of course. Seth game board. Seth can place purple action tokens only on the purple spaces of his pyramid. Seth can place an action token from an Alliance play player on any space of, in his pyramid. Huh? Okay. If an action token is placed on a yellow space, the action will impact the Alliance player of the corresponding color. All right. Now, I am hopefully not too stupid, but I'm stupid enough that for me, reading or listening to rules once, never completely do it. It's a primer, so... Please expect that as you're doing this, if you're anything like me, you will not automatically know how to play just from this, but hopefully this primes you. But this part here, I'm particularly fuzzy on because I don't see yet how Seth can use other people's tokens, but let's find out about that. And we look at Seth's game board and we see he just has overall more options. Um, there are purple spaces that he can use his own tokens on. He still has his divine will space at the top. That divine will space is the same as the golden token. The golden token was worded confusingly in the base game as to how it works and how it's different than the silver token. My advice to you is to reread how it's clarified in the Tassetti rules. You can find them online regardless of whether you have Tassetti or not. Uh, basically, and this is just a recap of something in the base game that people often get wrong. If you get a silver token and you're a regular player, you play it right after you play a regular token, basically getting two actions in a row. And you can put it in a different spot. With a golden token, you also play it right after a regular action. So two in a row, but you only place it at the top in that golden token spot the advantage of this is that it doesn't take up another space on the board so for instance if you're using it to pray to get two prayer points 
you would still have your prayer spaces left unused because it doesn't take up a spot. So that's why it's golden and stronger than silver. It does the action without taking up a spot on the player board, like a worker placement that doesn't require using up the space it's placed in. I hope that makes sense and wasn't just rambling, but if you're un unsure or confused, double check the rules for the golden token into SETI. Effects of purple spaces. Let's find out about those. Buy a power. Move, recruit, raise a pyramid. Same as commit. Okay, so it says that pretty casually here. But uh, buy a power. Interestingly, there's two for Seth. There's one of each color, black, uh, red, white, and blue, in the base game. But you can still only get one of each color per turn. Seth only has one color pyramid, but this is saying that, you know, he can buy two of them every round. So that's pretty huge. And with as for moving, uh, well, he's got... He has one regular move action, and we'll learn about the other kind in a second. Recruit, that seems to work the same way. Every prayer you spend you recruit a unit into your city. So that works the same. I then raise a pyramid. It looks like it's the same cost, pricing, and mechanism for him to increase his pyramid, his purple pyramid, at level one. But of course, he won't get a bonus victory point for having it at level four. Pretty cool, Seth. All right, Mr. Bird Vulture Muscle Man, what do you have to show for us next? The next action, Furious Invasion. That's that double foot thing. See, and multicolored because Seth is all inclusive, and I appreciate that. Furious Invasion. When using this action, Seth can move up to two different troops he controls on the board. He must respect the rules of movement of each troop and benefits from all the effects that affect the move slash action, uh, slash attack action. Both movements are simultaneous, and Seth has to complete them before resolving the consequences. If the move generates two battles, Seth will choose two combat cards and will assign one to each battle. He will not discard any cards face down for those two battles. For the Alliance, the battle preparation remains identical to Kemet. So this is very interesting because as we know that when you do a battle normally, you discard one card and you play one card. And of course, in the base game, players can choose whether to, do, to discard face up or face down. I like face down so that there's less of a overly pedantic card counting. But in this case, it's he won't, if he does both battles with a furious invasion and both movements end in a battle, neither will have to be discarded. What I'm unsure about is, does that imply that both battles happen kind of simultaneously it sounds like you do one then the other um so then we read up next the choice to assign divine intervention cards to any battle must be done during this preparation if both battles involve the same player in the alliance he will assign he will choose two combat cards and will assign one to each battle the battle resolution is not simultaneous and Seth chooses which battle will be resolved first. Once the consequences of the first battle are determined, the second battle is resolved. So it sounds like you simultaneously do both moves, and both moves could trigger a battle, and you would pick the battle cards and put them face down for each battle simultaneously, but then you resolve one, then the other, in the choice that Seth wants. Makes total sense. Up next, Invocation. Seth draws a Divine Intervention card from his deck. That's huge because normally for regular players, getting Divine Intervention cards only happens automatically through Knight or through special powers, especially white tiles. But here with Invocation, simply place it there and get a Divine Intervention card. Extremely powerful. And as I've glanced at before, his Divine Intervention cards are especially strong. Up next, Prey. This one's 
Barely different, Seth gains three prayer instead of the usual two prayer. Very strong. Effects of yellow spaces. Corrupt a creature. Seth chooses one of his creature cards and performs an attack with the chosen creature anywhere on the board by following these rules. The power tile of the chosen creature must still be available for, pur for purchase. The level of Seth's pyramid must be at least equal to the level of the chosen creature. But it notes that it doesn't have to be... It's obviously not the same color because Seth's purple pyramid is obviously not the white pyramid that a mummy would normally require. And yet Seth can still corrupt the mummy. That's very cool. The creature will have to attack a troop containing at least one unit of the Alliance player whose color matches the action token that was used to activate this power. The exception is the Knum Sphinx, which I think is the Black uh, Sphinx. This battle is not possible in cities except for the Phoenix, which is its specific power. The attack is resolved normally, and Seth can use Divine Intervention cards. If the creature wins the battle, Seth earns one combat victory point. Once the battle is resolved, Seth discards the creature card from his hand, and the creature is placed back on his power tile. Warning, when a creature power tile is purchased, Seth discards the corresponding creature card from his hand, so he can only corrupt a creature once per game, uh, per creature that is. That's very interesting, and this is different than what I expected, Un uh, unlike getting a permanent creature. He just temporarily charms it. So it's more temporary, it's like Encyclades, rather than the base game of Command. Uh, we may still have to recap a little bit about when, I think I read it earlier, that once per... Yeah, we'll read it again, that Seth uses other players' tokens once per round, I think, for each other person. Let's continue. So that was corrupting a creature. Pretty cool, Seth. Are you, you're cool, but can you be cruel? Corrupt a troop. Yes, he can be cruel. Seth can move a troop containing at least one unit of the player whose action token he uses. Seth must play the cost of moving the corrupt troop if necessary. Seth, like such as if it's teleporting to an obelisk, one presumes. Seth can only con corrupt a complete troop. At no time can he split it. He can trigger a battle that will have to be resolved between the two involved players. Both players involved in the fight cannot exchange any information until they have revealed their combat cards and any divine intervention cards. If the corrupt troop wins the fight, Seth wins the victory point. The rest of the consequences and the fight is managed by the Alliance. That is so cruel. He can force them to attack each other, force friends against friends, sowing mistrust and confusion. Seth, you are truly a monster. Warning, Seth cannot trigger a battle between troops consisting of units belonging exclusively to the same player. A single player cannot hit himself, also known as the why are you hitting yourself rule. Very common. So this is uh, extremely, extremely interesting. I'm just going to recap up here. You probably saw it, but uh, I just want to to make sure that I understand uh, that w you know Seth is getting tokens from the Alliance players. So I'm just recapping slightly here. My apologies. You let's see. It seems to be uh, escaping my dumb, tired eyes somewhere. But we know that Seth can use the powers of the enemy players. We know that he can corrupt a creature. Oh, that's why I wanted to go back up here. Sorry about that, folks. So let's look over here. These purple ones he can use his own tokens on. It's these yellow ones that we just went over. This top one up here, corrupt a creature. We see that kind of dark eyes there. 
the yellow around it to show that this is, uh, you know, from the Alliance players. The next one down is simply destroy two units. This requires using an Alliance token and it's just, it's just cold-blooded murder. He just normally takes a Divine Intervention card to even kill one, but he just straight up murders two. Below this is corrupt a pyramid. I think we'll go over that in a moment. And then below that, corrupt a troop. That's the cruel friend versus friend thing we saw a moment, a moment before. So that's pretty darn cool. Now, we saw that the warning Seth cannot trigger. Yeah, no hitting yourself rule. Now, destroy two units. Seth destroys two units belong to a player whose action token he used. So it has to be the same person whose action token you used. Seth can choose to destroy units of two different troops. As long as it's that same person. On the right here, it has a couple of examples. Um, for, like, say, the corrupt the troop thing. Backtracking here. It says, if the attacked troop is mixed, the fight will have to be played by a player of a different color. Indeed, a player cannot act as both the attacker and the defender in a battle. Example, Seth raised his pyramid, uh, purple pyramid, of course, to level two, and corrupts the pyramids of the green player who has level three red pyramid. He can only buy a red power level one or two with an additional cost of one prayer because his purple pyramid is not level three. Okay, so that is saying that when you corrupt a pyramid, which is, you know, what it sounds like, even though you're corrupting it, you can still go only up to your level of your purple pyramid. And indeed, I read that out of order. That's the example. Here's how it works. Corrupt a pyramid. Seth can buy a non-purple power tile using the pyramids in the city of the Alliance player, but of a value not exceeding his purple pyramid level. So just like we described, I've got, I'm Seth and I have a level three purple pyramid. You are another guy and you have a level four red pyramid it doesn't matter that it's level four when i corrupt your red pyramid i can only buy up to level three power tiles because i only have uh level three purple pyramid and finally seth has to pay an additional prayer to the uh to the cost of the tile acquired so it's a little more pricey but he can afford it his wallet is fat the alliance specific rules alliance members are allies and can talk to each other discuss strategies, and decide together on what to do to defeat Seth. Alliance discussions cannot be secret, and Seth has to be able to hear everything that is discussed. Reminds me of Dracula and Fury of Dracula, and I love this in, what, in one verse all that. You can collaborate all you want, but the mastermind, Seth, the god of death, god of chaos, he hears it. He knows what you're saying. He knows your thoughts. Alliance members cannot reveal their Divine Intervention cards to each other. Very good. Troops belonging to the members of the Alliance can never attack each other except under the effect of the Seth's special action, corrupt the troops, so they can't attack each other on purpose, and why would they want to? Troops belonging to the Alliance are limited to five units and one creature, so just like before. Permanent and temporary victory points acquired by Alliance members are common. So it's a single pool that they acquire. Truly is cooperative in the Alliance. To win one permanent victory point through the temples, the Alliance must control two temples in games where Alliance is controlled of two members. Three temples in games where the Alliance is composed of three members or more. All right, so that's interesting because you can get a permanent victory point through the temples. Just like before, like during the night phase. But uh, it's two if there's two members, but it takes three if there's three or more. That makes sense. Osiris Game Board. Members of the Alliance have at their disposal a new game board, allowing them to place the new powers of the Alliance. So that's cool. Prayer and power tokens 
of sacred temples. The power of the great ceremony and their permanent and temporary victory points. So this is just kind of like a collective mat, a collective tableau screen for them to, as a group, put all their cool stuff together. We've got the great ceremony, looks like an Ankh square. We have the three powers of the alliance. So that's interesting that they don't just kind of have you lay them out at the bottom of the red, black, and white. And then the prayer and power tokens of sacred temples. All right, pretty cool. Victory conditions. The Alliance immediately wins the game if it meets the following three conditions. One, build a sacred temple in the desert. Two, perform the great ceremony. Three, earn at least six permanent victory points. So this is very interesting because this means that there doesn't seem to be any obvious long-term benefit of temporary victory points for either Seth, obviously, or even the Alliance. Normally, those come from temporary control of temples and the uh, holding a level four pyramid. Very interesting. However, if the Alliance meets conditions one and two, it can also win by controlling at least one of the districts in the city of Seth at the beginning of its action phase. So in lieu of six permanent victory points, maybe there's just some way you can't do them if you take over Seth's, one of his city's districts, that can do it. Now that's a bit of arguably a fiddly nuance, but it's a fairly complex expansion if you add me. Almost perhaps seemingly too much, but I'm not sure. It might be perfect, so... I'm just reading the rules here. This is not supposed to be a review of the rules. These uh, conditions can be achieved in any order. Well, that's a huge thing to remember um, because the one, two, three, rather than bullet points, might imply to some, hey, do these in order. But no, you can do them in any order you want. So how do you build a sacred temple in the desert? Well, I'll tell you. In order to do this, the Alliance members will have to sacrifice units on a desert space without an obelisk before any action is performed by one of the members of the alliance the construction of a sacred temple is not an action therefore does not require any action tokens a desert space can only have one sacred temple a sacred temple has three levels and will be built in the following order level one level two level three at least that's intuitive Two comes after one, and three comes after two. Yeah, I'll write that down. All right, so that's what you do. You go into the middle of the desert where no obelisks are around, and before you do an action, one of the members just straight up murders a guy, and it builds a level. Uh, you know, the first level, if there's nothing there, and so forth. Warning, the Alliance can only build one level per action phase, but may decide to build several sacred temples in the same action phase. What? Um, warning. The Alliance can only build one level per action phase, but may decide to build several sacred temples in the same action phase. I think I understand. Let's look on the right. I think it gives it more info to sacrifice units is to remove them from the game board and put them back in reserve sacrificing a unit is not a recall players do not receive a prayer point from it the example the alliance has four units on a desert square without an obelisk at the beginning of its turn uh, the members decide to sacrifice one to lay the base of the temple the three units not sacrificed will remain in play on this same space. Uh, so that totally makes sense. I just don't get the thing that says several sacred temples in the same action phase. So I think that just means I'm stupid, of course. It, you, you can't, in the same action phase, build the same temple up to level one, then level two. But it, you could have one level one started over here, 
but then somewhere else have a level two move to a level three etc so level one the base of the temple cost sacrifice one unit requirement desert space without an obelisk effect the base of the temple it offers no power so here we look at the details of the sacred temple we have a little graphic here that shows i'll read from bottom to top bottom temple base that's uh level one level up to well, no it's not level that is level one but that's the bottom up next is prey level so then we see kind of around the foundations and above and up next power level then above that temple power so we're not sure what that means yet but there's four echelons or tiers of power for a sacred temple that obviously you build up to as you as you build up the sacred temple and on the right here we see power and prayer tokens we have the prayer token back and the prayer token front all right prayer token back just shows one onk one prayer point prayer token front probably has variable things it can show then power tokens front and back temple power tokens front and back so we don't know what those mean yet but we're about to level two the prey level sacrifice two units requirement the sacred level a sacred temple of level one so obviously by requirement they mean in order to go to level two you have to have a level one to build on top of the cost is two units you have to kill two guys to get to level two um effect the alliance randomly draws a prayer token and places it backside up on the osiris board so the alliance randomly takes you so you take one of those prayer tokens those kind of rectangular-ish things and you place it backside up so it's hidden on the osiris board the prey level provides one prayer to one of its controllers at the end of each day phase okay so so one at the you know so if there's multiple people there at the temple then they choose which person of those controllers if it's red and blue are there then you know, blue okay you get the bonus prayer from controlling this over on the right to control a sacred temple players have to be on the desert space where the sacred temple is built so being there you get the power while you're there seth can take control of a temple but will only benefit from prayer at the end of the day phase right so that makes sense um okay level three the power level cost sacrifice three units requirement sacred level two all right so again same thing here we murder three more people um and before we'd murder size so to get to level three you've murdered six people six units which you know are potentially that's hundreds or thousands of people lots of sacrificing to gods but in this world all supernatural stuff is real and maybe it is in real life who's to say requirement uh sacred temple level two of course effect the power level allows the alliance to complete a victory condition gain power and increase the prey level the power level allows the alliance to complete a victory condition gain a power and increase the prey level so uh gaining a victory condition means one of those three things you have to do to win have a sacred temple at level three um it also gain a power yeah so once the power level is reached the temple is considered as a classical temple and gives the same bonus as described in the commit rule books okay so it's like level three becomes a standard temple meaning that um you know if you have two or more you can get a permanent victory point at the end of the day phase the alliance randomly draws a power token and places it on the osiris board 
They then select the corresponding temple power token and place it at the top of the sacred temple. The Alliance now benefits from this power regardless of the temple's occupation by the Alliance or Seth. Finally, the Alliance flips the corresponding temple prayer token to increase the gain of prayer at the end of each day's phase. Um, so over on the right, we read already that Seth can take control of a temple, but will only benefit from the prayer at the end of the day phase. And underneath that, now we see only a sacred temple at level three counts for the gain of a temporary victory point or a permanent victory point for controlling temples. So that's, of course, what they meant when they said controlling classical, uh, you know, counting like a classical temple. It's like level three is a fully built temple in addition to its, uh, its powers. So that's pretty cool. Now, when we looked up here, yeah, so when we saw the sacred temple, it had four echelons to it, but there's still only three levels to a temple. The fourth thing, the temple power, is just specifying the, the power that, you know, goes up there. There's no fourth level to it. So just that graphic is at first uh, br uh, blush, slightly confusing to the naive Michael Eldridge. The Great Ceremony, this is the next victory condition for the Alliance. To perform the Great Ceremony, one or more uh, members of the Alliance will have to be on a desert space with an obelisk, not necessary uh, on the same space. I think they mean not necessarily on the same space, but same difference perhaps. And spend a certain amount of prayer. All right, so you want to perform a Great Ceremony. One or more members of the Alliance go to a desert space with an obelisk, doesn't have to be the same space, and spend some prayer. Participating in the Great Ceremony is not an action, and no action token is needed to proceed. Okay, cool. Can you do it at any time during the day phase then? Or Let's read on. Spend prayer points. The total cost of the Great Ceremony is 10 prayer points per member of the Alliance collectively. So if there's three members of the Alliance, you know, three versus one Seth, then between them, they have to spend 30. That's gigantic. Each temporary victory point acquired by the Alliance reduces the cost by four. Aha, here we have our answer. So even though temporary victory points do not at all give you a direct uh, means to win by victory points, you know, they reduce the cost of the great ceremony. So all you guys get around the obelisks and are kind of chanting in a, in a cultish way, but not in a way that sounds like me doing an impression of cultural appropriation, just in a generic miscellaneous kind of cultish way. And, uh, that was really good because it gave the impression I wanted to give, but didn't sound racist. So it's a double one. So just really make sure we have this super clear here. Spin prayer points. The total cost of the great number 10 members. Now, um, that's the total cost, but it doesn't sound like the members have to each pitch in uh, equally or even at all. So let's say that there's 30 required because there's three members. Well, you really all do have to pitch in because the maximum prayer that each alliance member can have i think is 12 right and you can't go over that max so they even if two members spent 12 each you would still have to have six being spent by the remaining member so really you all need to fatten up your bank account with prayer points and spend it all for the great ceremony you know unless you reduce it a bunch by having many temporary victory points so that is very intricate. That's interesting. And also thematically, it makes sense because it's like, oh, you've reached level four with your pyramid. Temporary victory point makes the great ceremony easier. And then also we control more temples. Oh, makes the great ceremony easier. Super thematic. I love that. Wonderful design. These designers are brilliant. Finalization of the great ceremony. The great ceremony allows the alliance to complete a victory condition. Choose a power token from those remaining and activate the portal to the city of Seth. 
Alliance members choose one of the remaining power tokens, which now benefit, uh, which now benefits the Alliance and is placed on the Osiris board. The Great Ceremony opens Seth's portal to the Alliance. Flip the portal token on the desert space bordering the west bank of the Nile on its open side. From now on, the Alliance can try to invade the city of Seth. So that is super interesting. Over on the right, it has an example. Let's read it. The Alliance consists of three players. The cost of the Great Ceremony is therefore 30. Just like I said. Brian and Nikki each raised one of their pyramids to level four. And the Alliance controls a temple. The Alliance therefore has three temporary victory points for a total reduction of 12. John and Nikki are on two different desert spaces with an obelisk. They will have to spend 30 minus 12 equal 18 between them to finalize the great ceremony. So it does kind of seem to indicate that you can only contribute if you are on the obelisk. Yeah. Um, in fact, the first sentence, just the grammar of it, that's how it follows. It just wasn't super explicit with its own separate like note. You can't contribute prayer unless you're on the obelisk also. It does just make sense, though, of course. I mean, how can you go around the obelisk if, you know, if, if you're not there? Then finally... The last win condition for the Alliance doesn't have to be done in order. Earn six permanent victory points. The Alliance must have at least six permanent victory points. So that is interesting, but we also know that can be foregone if they instead take over a city district of Seth. Hmm. I wonder which way they'll go. Now, buy a purple power tile. An alliance member can buy a Seth power tile during the day phase if all three of his pyramids are at level equal or higher to the level of the purple power tile he wants to buy. Oh, that is interesting. For example, if he wants to buy a level two purple power tile, he will need to have three levels, uh, three pyramids at level two or higher. So, you know, that gets increasingly impossible in the sense of very, very hard for someone to have three level four pyramids and still be strong in other ways because it just takes so much prayer. So it sounds like it would be rare for someone to get in the alliance to get a level four purple power tile, but I'm sure it's possible. To perform this action, he will place his action token on the buy a power tile space on the color of his choice. Very cool. Mixed troops. The specific speci uh, specificities. Specificities? Yeah, that's what it says. The specificities of mixed troops. A mixed troop can be composed of units belonging to several members of the alliance. Mixed troops can be moved by any member who possesses at least one unit in that troop. The Alliance player who moves a mixed troop must have at least one of his units in the troop from beginning to the end of the movement. A member of the Alliance can retrieve and slash or leave units of other Alliance members or their own units on spaces crossed during the movement. When a mixed troop occupies a district where a pyramid is located, it is considered to be controlled by each member having a unit in the mixed room. Mixed troops benefit from each different battle power tile controlled by each member uh, having a unit in the mixed room. So it seems totally worthwhile to try to mix troops whenever possible because you're going to get the powers of every member in that troop. But of course, getting your troops too mixed together is not automatic because clearly you can still only recruit from your own city and you have to travel to them, etc. Overall here on, well, we'll 
we'll read an example on the right in a moment, but first let's look at creatures and mixed troops. A creature is still tied to its controller. If the last unit of a player controlling a creature in a troop is destroyed, the creature immediately returns to a city district containing a unit of that player of his choice. Otherwise, it is put in reserve on its power tile. A player can only move a troop with a creature if it is accompanied by at least one unit belonging to the player who controls the creature. The troop accompanying the creature benefits from all its effects. Okay, so that makes sense. Again, you benefit from all the effects of all the mixed units and the troops, every alliance member there. It's still tied to its original owner, and if the uh, last unit of a player controlling a creature in a troop is destroyed, the creature right. So, you know, if the elephant is owned by, you know, the cat player, then if the last cat player unit dies, then the elephant goes back to the city district of the cat player or onto their power tile they own until they recruit again. Uh, player points and mixed troops. When a mixed troop recovers prayer, they're always distributed among the members of the alliance whose units are present in the troop at player's will. This rule applies when units are recalled following a battle for the control of a temple at the end of the day phase, but also when the effect of a combat power triggers, such as, for example, the crusade white power tile. So if they would get prayer for any reason, such as if they decide, let's recall, because after we lost or won that battle, they can... So that's interesting. If you had three red units and two blue units together, and they all have recalled, you could agree to have five prayer go to one of the players um, if you wanted. You don't have to try to divvy up in a way that's always the most logical it sounds like then up next uh oh geez this is uh how do i move this guy down there we go yeah battle against seth as soon as troops uh, as soon as a troop of uh, of the alliance is in the same territory as a troop of seth a battle must be resolved if the troop has units from different members of the alliance, the concerned members agree to determine which of them will resolve the fight and therefore use his own combat cards and, if applicable, his own divine intervention cards. In case of damage caused by Seth, it is the alliance that chooses which units to eliminate. All of the benefits gained in combat are shared among the alliance members who participate in the fight. So that's mostly pretty intuitive, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, you, they basically have to agree which of them will do the fight. Well, because, you know, combat card versus combat card, it doesn't seem to be that you would add several combat cards of the Alliance together against Seth's because then you would always just, and there'd be no reason to not do a mixed troop. It just wouldn't be worth it otherwise. But uh, so it sounds like you pick who does the fight against them. Underneath that, we have some thanks to people. And I would like to thank those people also. And here you can see all the thanks. Ah, thank you, these people. Ah, you did a great job. But up here on the right, there's a final thing I want to look at is this final example. Um, and there are several things on this page. So context will tell us what's an, it's an example of. Example, Oliver, green player. Brian, blue player, and Nikki, yellow player, are members of the Alliance. Oliver has a troop with four units and controls the creature, Royal Scarab. He uses a move action and therefore has a movement capacity of three spaces, one basic and two awarded by the Royal Scarab. He enters a space where Brian has two units and Nikki has three and controls the ancestral elephant, Oliver decides to leave two of his troops on the space, then to recover one blue unit and one yellow unit, thus composing 
a mixed troop with units of the three members of the Alliance. Oliver now continues his move of two spaces to control a temple, finishing his move with two legal troops. Then up next it says one, a green-yellow-blue troop of five units accompanied by the ancestral elephant of Nikki. Two, a green-yellow-blue troop of four units accompanied by the royal scarab. He could also have left the royal scarab and go back with Nikki's ancestral elephant. On the other hand, Oliver could not have one, left or gone with six units, two, left the royal scarab with the ancestral elephant, three, finished with the ancestral elephant and the royal beetle, because in these situations, some troops would have been illegal at the end of the, his move. I'm sure this example makes total sense, and I think almost reading it out loud made it harder for me to get. I think a graphic would have helped in some ways that just made that less clear to me but these were all this whole thing is meant to be a primer so that's the end of it you can stop now if you want the rest is just me giving some final finishing commentary feel free to stop the video if you like the video you know please like and subscribe if you didn't like you know don't dislike my life is hard. my life is not easy right now at all just validation on the internet is literally one of the best things i can get so if you dislike it because you want to hurt my feelings, guess what? It'll work. I'll be like, mm -hmm. all right, I'm joking now, but now you can do whatever you want. Uh, thanks for listening, though. I appreciate it, guys. I got to find out when and how many tokens does Seth get of the Alliance. I know you already heard. You already know. You're smarter than me. I get it. But uh, I want to find out. Oh, copyrighted music, sorry. But anyway, in terms of the game, it sounds awesome. It sounds cool. It sounds thematic. I'm excited for it. Also, I, one thing that's both good and disappointing is it sounds complex. I mean, I feel like with Tassetti, if someone's kind of a gamer already or a quasi-gamer, you can still jump in with all the modules of Tassetti, the first game. It's possible if they're at least a little bit of a gaming person. But um, if someone's never played Kemet before at all, I don't know how comfortable hardly anyone except like a turbo nerd like me and you listening to this would be comfortable playing with Seth right away if they had never played Kemet before. Like maybe. And I don't think I saw where it was written in here, but I read somewhere else that you can play with all the other modules of Tassetti, but again, you can't play with the path to Tassetti, the actual city of Tassetti. And that would be too much anyway. It would feel like your attention was drawn in too many places. Uh, so I'm just backtracking here just for my own amusement. Maybe I'll just glance over any sticking points that I had. You may have different sticking points. This may not be helpful. But... um. All yeah, the eclipse all night all night effect power tiles are triggered. Just power tiles, right? Recalling a troops when uh, players do it, they get minus one to how many they would recall. Seth during the night phase gains a number of prayer equal number of players, and the alliance uh, that are in the alliance draw that he has a troop limit of six and one creature. He can only recall a battle if he loses, and Seth can only win combat victory points. Right, he wins on the 8th or 10th victory point, depending on how you play it. Seth can place purple tokens only. Oh, okay, so rem all right, on the right here, reminder. In a four-player game, Seth plays against three members of the Alliance. He has four purple action tokens, one of each color chosen by the Alliance players. So just every round... And that's kind of what I intuitively thought or just forgot that I already read. That, and, and correct me if I get any of this wrong at all, please. And I will make a note to correct it. But so it sounds like just every game, once, like, you know, Seth's plethora to choose from will be his purple tokens plus one stolen from each of 
the members. So that makes total sense. So I think it's all kind of coming together that you kind of play out according to the the track, the day phase track. And really, it just totally seems that you would want people to be familiar with commit before you play before you play with the Seth expansion. But in terms of having a one versus all thematic war game, I've never seen something that was this cool to me with the building up the temples, with the sometimes stealing Seth's power tiles, but other times he's stealing your power tiles, but then he can corrupt your creatures temporarily. Just the richness of the theme coming through and just the city overlay. Like it, it clearly makes the game much more complicated, but if you are a diehard Comet fan like me, then this is just um, a gold mine of, of delicious delightfulness and alliteration with these. With all the, these great rules, baby. All right, stupid. And you say stupid crap. No one will like your channel. It's fine. Whatever. All right, example of play recalls or ring four units after fighting will cover three. Uh, I'm going to look at just a couple more things. Again, I'm assuming you've already stopped the video. Pray, Seth gains three. I'm spazzing out, jumping around. Um, yeah, this is what I want to do. Just look over. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. All right. So Seth, during setup, he has his individual tray and a number of purple action tokens equal to the number of players in the alliance plus one. Right. Okay. So it's not just he uses all his purple. If he's playing against three players, he would have four purple, and then one of each of of theirs is what it sounds like. All right. You have any questions? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to hear if you had any questions. This is a recording. This is not live. But uh, Osiris is super cool. So this is not the rules reference that shows, um, you know, the new power tiles for purple and the new three power of the alliance things you can get. Well, the red one is really cool because that's a creature that is Osiris, and he's, you know, a good guy, God. He's on our side, and he is very cool because he makes it so that whatever troop he's in, that troop gains all of the powers of the everybody in the Alliance, regardless of whether it, it's a mixed troop or not. So it's acting like it's always a mixed troop, and he doesn't take up the creature slot. So he's like a mega creature, meaning that just like the, you know, Greek... Cyclades crossover with the the archer uh, centaur, just like with that, you could have an additional creature. So you could have like the giant um, scorpion and Osiris leading, you know, the alligator army, and then they have all the powers of all the other alliance members including their own now i don't think it means you the other creatures because creatures are still spatially dependent but if someone else has you know like war rage or that gives plus one attacking then you would get it too by having osiris so that's just one commentary on one new power tile that's available only for the alliance as a red power tile um that is just fantastic so this is really great. I may have to listen to, you know, my own rules here just to understand this better more than once. Even though I don't like hearing the sound of my own voice, people may think that I do because I do voice stuff, but I actually don't love it because it sounds like like a dollar store Dracula, like an off-brand Disney villain, like, I don't know. It's cool in its way, but it's not for me. No, it's fine. All right. Anyway, I think so much. For, chat, for hanging out with me for this last hour, hour and 10 minutes. I appreciate it. Keep on gaming, cool, attractive people with your awesome emotional intelligence. And be honest with me, but also be kind. But don't be that kind, but be honest.
just be yourself. I'll see you later.